That was such a nice introduction. I kind of feel like she gave my whole talk, so <laughs> we can just go out now. <laughs> oh. um, well, I didn't know if this would be too fancy of an environment to bring my chicken purse, <laughs> but I thought, you know, I do want to bring my chicken purse because chickens are hilarious. Um, if you have never seen a chicken sprint before, you are missing out because you know their their neck goes out and then their body races to to get underneath and then they're sort of waddling and it's all this little circus going on in front of you and because of that i think that chickens are the perfect way to talk about a topic like agricultural economics because it needs to be a little fun so looking at our farm you might think um, that we really drew upon our, our farm background, the agricultural history we had in us. But, but no, we were writers, we we're glorified typists, and all of a sudden we have this farm, or as I like to say, I own half the debt of locally laid egg farm. And how did this farm befall me, you might ask? And it started with a date night with this guy. I went out to dinner with Jason, and you know, it's a Mexican restaurant, and the, the beer is cold, and the chips are warm, and all of a sudden he starts talking to me about commercial poultry, which really wasn't the sweet talk I was hoping for. Um, so, so I became kind of a passive listener, a, a, a very passive listener. And he's talking to me about how 90%, 95% of America's eggs at that time came from the caged industry, which is very efficient that birds eat in the front in their trough, they lay an egg, it rolls down, goes into a conveyor, and goes off to be processed. And that's how you get eggs that are $1.19. Now I think there's probably, there are fewer of these operations, maybe 90% of our eggs come from places like this. Um, and then we started talking about cage-free. Cage-free has gotten really popular. And lots of times people say like, oh Lucy, now I buy cage-free eggs. And then I have to break their hearts and be like, well that's not exactly what we're talking about here. Because um, you know, they're free to roam around their warehouse. Uh, my joke is that it's kind of like they live in a casino. Uh, they have really no idea what's going on outside. Some do have minimal access to the outdoors, but for the most part, they're pretty, they're pretty much indoor creatures. But this is what he wanted to talk about, pasture-raised birds. Actually, we call our birds salad-eating poultry athletes because they're out there enjoying a, a whole salad bar of a diet with bugs and seeds and grasses and what I like to call wrong place, wrong time frogs who <laughs> will jump into the paddock. So because they have a varied diet, they end up having more omega-3s, um, less fat, less cholesterol, so you really do get a different egg. Um, but back at the restaurant, where I'm being a very passive listener, I get pulled out because my husband says this utterly unignorable statement of, this is the kind of farm I want to start. And now I'm listening. I am really listening. I'm listening so hard I could pop a blood vessel. And um, we engaged in what uh, we now call the farmgument, which was very loud and very public, uh, where I was gently told him I was not very supportive of this idea. A lot of stuff happened. It's not worth getting into. We don't have much time. But in it, Jason got to go be and do something rather heroic. And I realized that um, it, it rendered Jason utterly uncubicable, meaning that he was never going back into a cubicle and writing anymore. And um, so I said, fine. We can do this poultry thing, but you need, to, you need to take farm classes, and you need to take business classes, and you need to write a business plan, and go have a mentor, or at least visit someone's farm, which he did all that. But then, of course, you have the practical and the theoretical, and they're often really different. Um, this is my brother-in-law. Um, he's 
apparently rock farming there. Um, but experience, you just can't Google that, which is so true. Because we had no idea how difficult this was going to be. Because we wanted to go from five hens to 1,800 in a summer. Now, when I say it wasn't easy, it's not because of it, we didn't really know how to care for that many birds, for the watering and the feeding, and then, of course, the packing and the washing and the labeling. All those things were very hard, but what was really incredibly difficult was procuring pullet birds, which are birds just on the cusp of maturity. You think, like, how hard can this be? But we... Um, well, if you're a backyard birder, I don't know if there are any people here, you know it's pretty easy to go to the farm store, like Fiona's dad, and you can grab like four or ten out from underneath the heat lamp. Um, or if you are in the industry, you, your big egg, you call up the hatchery that you likely own and place your minimum order of 30,000 or 300,000. But we're like completely stuck in the middle. So we ended up, uh, after exhausting all our resources, we ended up going um, with a guy. Now, if any of you are taking notes, I want you to write down right now, never predicate your business on a guy, because <laughs> he might not be a great guy. <laughs> um, so we got our birds, and our guy actually packed them all up. He was in Iowa and got on the road and then called to tell us he was coming. Now, we didn't know a lot about farming, but we did know that Duluth, in a rare heat wave of over 100 degrees, on a weekend that there is a huge special event, a marathon that puts an extra 50,000 people on essentially one highway, <laughs> we would not have chosen this day for him to come. Um, but he did come, and our birds arrived dehydrated and road-weary and um, just on the brink of not surviving. They were also skinny and maybe not, didn't have the chick hood that we hoped they had had. Um, let me see, my other prop here. And the... We busied ourselves the first day they were on pasture. For one thing, we realized they didn't really know how to be pasture birds. Um, our backyard hens, you let them out in the morning and they are on the hunt. You know, they are out there just scratching and finding every bug and worm. Um, flies were landing on these birds, which is, that's a very embarrassing poultry event, you know, but they just didn't know what to do. But we had worked all day, and I'm just, before I go home with our children, because this was rented land, um, I want to see the, I want to see them all go put themselves to bed. So I have a very brief passage to read to you. At dusk, hens seek their coop. So reliable is this, there's even a saying, an adage, chickens come home to roost. It's for warmth, it's for protection, it's hardwired. But our first shipment of 900 mature birds just purchased from a commercial operator stands on the field staring. They tilt and turn their heads to better align us with their side play size as though awaiting instructions. Then as darkness quiets the pasture, I get it. My hand on my lips, I mumble, oh God, these hens are out of sync with sunset because until today, they had never seen the sun. While I'd worried about so many things going wrong with our unlikely egg startup, chickens, not knowing how to be chickens, was not one of them. So these birds, we ended up having to put all 900 birds back into their coops one by one. And as, um, by now it's quite dark, and I look into the coops when we're all finished and I say, they're not roosting. And roosting is a big deal. 
as you can see here, those highly placed sticks, those are roofs where birds are supposed to come up and they'll cuddle together and they sleep together and it's good for other reasons like airing out one's tail feathers. Uh, but they also, they can't all be on the ground floor of this multi-level high rise that we had built for them. It's actually quite dangerous. They could smother themselves. So. Um, Jason, being a bright guy, said, Lucy, you should go home. Drink some wine, perhaps a box. <laughs> and he waited until the chickens were very asleep. And some of you may know that when chickens sleep, they're like malleable drunks, you know? If, if you see chickens on the internet wearing sweaters, that bird was asleep. <laughs> But he donned his headlamp and took these sleeping birds and put them up one by one by one. And he did that for almost three weeks until he rewired their little poultry brains and they started to figure it out. Like they figured out how to be on pasture and forage and how to come home to roost. So you, a good question is why? Why is it that procuring chickens was nearly impossible? In 1916, there were six million mid-sized farms where one could think someone going into the business could easily buy birds, get a little mentorship, and help you with this fledgling business. Um, but what happened? Well, middle agriculture. This is a term I did not know four years ago. I was perfectly fine not knowing this term four years ago. Um, but what it is, this middle ag, mid-sized farms like ours are like gangly teens. We don't fit in. We can't sell everything we produce at a farmer's market. Um, and it's very hard for farmers to make a real living just by doing farmer's market. And nor are we big enough to truly participate in the big food economic system. So we're stuck here in the middle. Um, my joke is that uh, there's nothing sexy about middle ag or middle age. And lucky me, I'm both. <laughs> but it also is hard that middle agriculture, or this says idle agriculture, um, we don't get the benefit of the scale of economy. Like people in big egg get to shop at the Costco of farm needs or the Sam's Club. You know, they get to buy in bulk, get good prices. Mid-sized farms, like locally laid, we're lucky if we can go to the corner store and if there's anything to buy, given our place in the industry when it comes to buying all our inputs and our farm needs. The other reason that it was so hard for us to buy birds was clearly because of World War II. <laughs> I started, I really wanted to answer this question and I dug deep and I've done a lot of nerdy research which all of you have to endure. But I've taken 70 years of history and packed it into about a minute and a half. Let's go. All right. So I'm going to take Grant Wood's um, American Gothic painting and use it as an illustration. Um, this is actually a portrait of a farmer and his daughter. But for a few minutes, let's just pretend that they're Mr. and Mrs. Gothic, and they are pre-war farmers. In pre-war America, um, there would have been a lot of farm hands because at that time, pest management was really, and weeding, was mostly a hands-on operation. So you had a lot of farm hands. But then uh, Germany invaded Poland, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and then in a zeitgeist of love of country, lots of these farm hands enlisted and went and fought World War II. During World War II, there was a lot of need for food. Um, the farmers were called soldiers of the soil because they were feeding America. They were feeding soldiers and allied countries were starving. And so they were cranking out lots of yield and being well paid for it. So actually farmers were doing financially well at this time. When peace happened, uh, farmers started buying more land because they had all that extra money and bigger farm implements, which they needed because um, 
folks weren't coming back to the farm like they had been because they were using their GI bills and they were putting down their, their hose and picking up pencils and getting degrees. What did come home from the war, I'm sorry, that's a DT, DDT and nitrates, lots and lots of chemicals came home. Um, and there is, agriculture started to change, our college and universities started teaching farmers how to use chemicals. Also, the Marshall Plan was going on, so that there was a huge market for goods. Farmers were selling everything they produced because 16.5 million tons of food was being shipped off to, uh, to help Europe during their recovery time. So it's like they were having a little bit of a post-war bender. It was like a big party to be a farmer at that moment. Things were going so well until they weren't. And the Marshall Plan stopped, you know, the, the Europeans started taking care of their own farm needs. And the, de the nitrates they were using, which did so well, the fertilizer on their virgin soil, started to experience diminishing returns. Like they needed to buy more and put more and put more. And their yields were smaller. Also, that says New Deal protections with a slash through it. This is when Secretary of Agriculture um, Earl, Earl Bunce, uh, he was pretty notorious for getting people, getting farmers to create lots and lots and lots of crops. At the same time, he dismantled almost all of FDR's protections that he put in to protect farmers from the caprice of the commodity market. So, benders do not end well for us or for the Gothics. Um, there were record foreclosures, and you can just kind of picture that whole house being gone behind them. And you thought they looked austere before. <laughs> so what happened? We lost four million farms in 100 years. So two-thirds of what we had before. Um, these were small, diverse farms. And to explain the difference, in 1910, let's pretend that this is a dollar that you would spend on some sort of agricultural products, like carrots. 15% would go to inputs, meaning whatever the farmer spent for seeds, what little they spent on any sort of fertilizer. 44% went to the marketer. And when I say marketer, don't think jingles or celebrity spokesperson, think, um, think of everything that needs to get done to get a product to market, that kind of marketer. So, um, so if you, shaving a carrot into a baby carrot <laughs> would be an example of that. But that left a pretty generous hunk for the farmer, which they need to cushion for the bad year, since it's a pretty risky business out there. So instead of that, instead of our four million, those four million farms became, or became kind of cannibalized into large, vertically integrated monoculture models. So meaning farms that just grew one thing. And um, the vertically integrated, meaning that these big corporate farms owned all the stops in the supply chain. Like they might own the seed company, or they might own the fertilizer company. They had interests in stocks in all those things. So let's look ahead to 1990 when we're fully industrialized. Inputs have gone up a lot. And that's because now their seeds are patented. And we're using a lot of fertilizer. And it has a lot of research behind it. And it's very expensive. Oh my gosh, the marketer is sort of off the hook now at 67%. Um, I think it takes a lot of money to take the chicken breasts and turn it into a microwavable chicken nugget because <laughs> a lot of processed foods happen in this time. And look what that leaves our farmer. Not even a dime of that food dollar. So if Mr. and Mrs. Gothic just gave their food away, your food bill wouldn't even be 10% less on the buck. That's sort of radical. So 
back to locally laid. Um, a year into it, we were just starting to get, un get our feet under us. Um, we had some minor distribution going on. Um, I was getting up some media attention, talking poultry every place I could. And farmers started to approach us about doing contract production. And I was aghast because I'd been doing all this nerdy research and everything I could tell was that contract production was like servitude for farmers. Um, the Pew Charitable Trust actually has a really great white paper on it. I had just read it and he's coming to me with this and I'm like, no, absolutely not. Um, but Jason had a radical idea and this is a direct quote. We could write the contracts so they don't suck. I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, well, I hadn't really thought about that, but of course, we could write the contracts so they're not disadvantageous to the other farmers. And that is what we did. And the best news is, is that we end up taking on all the risk. <laughs> <laughs> whether we, you know, these farmers get paid whether we sell these eggs or not. So this is the way our contracts are. Jason went out into the world and found homes for all these future eggs by knocking on back doors and being his pleasantly obnoxious, gregarious self in egg selling. And this is how it's worked out. And the first thing I want to say, it's called value chains. This is, this is the academic term for it. It makes it sound like I'm telling you we're so perfect. We are so not perfect. But the opposite of vertical integration is called value chains. So in a region, um, this represents Mora, Minnesota. We have a number of contract producers there, partner farms. And we said to them, instead of us bringing you feed, contract out or ask your neighbors to grow your corn, but grow non-GMO corn, um, and now create some economic activity in your region. And oh, you have a feed mill? That's not that far from you. Use that, because that way that will keep it local. And here's the big one. The three of you should get together and build an egg washing facility for washing and packing and grading and getting ready to, for distribution because that will give some supplementary income to folks in this really rural location and that will bring more money as well. Um, and this is opposed to like if it were vertically integrated, we would ship in our own feed and then we would take the dirty eggs out and bring it to our own facility, and that would, that would deprive that region of all that swirling economic uh, revenue going on. So this photo is meant to represent one of our farmers there. Um, Jonas would not want me to take his picture. He's an Amish gentleman, so I wouldn't do that. But Jonas had been renting his land for years. And just this spring, he bought it on the strength of his locally laid contract. And that's really goosebumpity stuff because honestly, I'm still just a gal with a laptop. I am a glorified typist who also happens to run a chicken farm or own a chicken farm. But this is a good time to talk a little bit and do a shout out to um, the places that buy from mid-sized farmers, like restaurants. If it says on the menu that it is locally sourced, those people are working hard because what they're giving up, they are giving up the, um, the ease of just ordering off a giant truck and checking off the boxes of what they want, having it arrive, it all fits perfectly in their cooler and they write out one check. Instead, yahoos like me are at their back door delivering stuff in whatever recycled container we have and then they have 70 other invoices to deal with. So it really isn't easy. Um, this, these folks, Duluth Grill, were early adopters and we're big fans of theirs. Markets, it's the same story. It's another invoice, it's another delivery. It's a lot of work for them to deal with us. 
And when we finally got our first distributor, Upper Lakes Foods, they like plucked us out of obscurity and held our hand and worked with us because they were trying to develop a sustainable agricultural line of food. And so why are they doing all this? Is it because they're super good people? Yes, and <laughs> customers are asking for it. People say to me all the time, like, oh, could we get locally laid eggs in my such and such store? And I'm like, yes, and I will do so much better getting them in there if you, as a consumer, tell the dairy manager you want that. And five of your friends say that you will support this product because they want to give you what you want. And consumers, I worry, forget that you are so powerful in this whole chain. All right, um, in 2014, I got a nasty gram. I got a letter from someone who, who bought, a, bought some eggs in haste, went home, looked at our name, and lost his mind. Some highlights was that he said that I was bringing crudeness into the world, that I was vulgar. Actually, he tried to tell me that I was sexualizing eggs, and I'm like, oh, that happened well before me. <laughs> But where I got irked on his letter was that he was complaining that they were high priced. Because I am now a nice little Midwestern woman of middle age, I put the letter aside for a while and let it steep <laughs> and then started writing him back. And the first thing I did was I acknowledged his point. He actually did have one because we push the envelope just a little bit. I get it, we do. We're, we're cheeky, we're out there. Um, but I wanted him to know what was behind that name. So in my letter, as my husband says, I went full frontal farmer on him. <laughs> so I, I, I wrote about the mind-blowing labor that we have at our farm because we're moving fences by hand, we're gathering by hand, we are hand placing them into our Aqua Magic 5 1952 refurbished egg washer. My joke is that it's so much better than the Aqua Magic 4. <laughs> um, you know, and more labor, there's the egg washer. Uh, and also, this is completely aside, we as a country, we use about 600 million gallons of water every year washing eggs, whereas the whole continent of Europe does not. I wrote an, a piece in the LA Times about it. If you Google my name, you can learn way too much about eggs and washing. But I also, um, I wanted to talk about food miles with him, how most things that are on your kitchen counter will travel further this year than you get to go on vacation. And there are consequences to that. There's a lot of diesel, and of course, you, it's because of vertical integration. I talked about how our company plants a tree with every delivery because it's part of our low miles ethos. I told them we were microbrewed because our flocks are th about two to three percent the size of a typical flock when you're when you're talking about big egg, and because it's a smaller flock, we know those birds actually do get outside. Sometimes you have to take the lazy ones and toss them out. <laughs> you're going out. Um, but you know that they get outside, and you know that, that you lay eyes on them. So they have some, you have an idea if they're well, and um, you know that they get to indulge in their instincts, like, you know, being outside. I also talked to him about how government subsidies for my competitors' eggs make corn almost free. You know, I pay a lot more for corn than they do, and um, that doesn't seem like a very fair playing field. I did tell him I would happy, happily send him one of our local Chicks Are Better t-shirts, but I didn't think he would wear it. And I ended it saying, like, would you have learned all this if we were named Amundsen Farms? No. So I wrote all this out, and I showed it to my husband because I want to put an open letter on the internet. And he's like, oh, honey, it's kind of wonky. You have a lot of USDA stats in there. And I'm like, fine, but I'm putting it up anyway. So I did put it up and kept my expectations low. Um, by the first, 
I think it was the first night it crashed our website. We had 250,000 click-throughs. Our, our web provider is like, what is going on? <laughs> uh, and Facebook said 350,000 people saw it. We ended up on a lot of radio stations, and we weren't talking about our name locally laid. We were talking about middle agriculture, that really unsexy thing. It was so great. Um, and I tell you this, not, not because I want you to think I'm a great writer, it's because I want you to know that people care about this. A lot of people cared about this, and the best part was, we sold a lot of t-shirts. <laughs> we sold 500 t-shirts in just a few days. And it was such, you could just feel the excitement around it. And that is so heartening. And so I wanted to bring you the good news that as hard as farming is right now, there's a lot of hope out there too. And I like to end on this slide. <laughs> It keeps me humble. <laughs> this is probably the worst photo of me ever. Um, and actually, so we are, we are being Mr. and Mrs. Gothic over here. Um, I screwed up this photo a lot by laughing. And then Jason said, just think about what it felt like to sign the third mortgage on the house. <laughs> And that's what I look like <laughs> when I am contemplating debt. <laughs> but that's my presentation. Thank you very much for being so engaged. Any types of questions? And we have, we have time for questions if we, anyone has any poultry related emergencies. Yes, yeah. got a question right over here. Judge, hold on, wait for the microphone there, Judge. How do you. I'm wondering about the varmints. I raise barnyard chickens, and every varmint in the world is after chickens. Dogs, cows, foxes, skunks, possums, raccoons. Mm -hmm. How do you keep them out of your flock? Well, we have these solar electric fences, and they're portable, and it has a little suitcase with a solar panel, and I remember saying to Jason, how much can that hurt? A lot. A lot. I call that box, I call that suitcase the big box of bad words, <laughs> because it, it's very effective. For birds of prey, we put up balloons with big scary eyes on them and fence and flags. I will admit, though, that there are some pretty fat hawks around locally laid. We don't, we don't save them all, but the electric fence really works. One other question. Are those Rhode Island Reds or hybrids or what? These are, um, we use, we've used Rhode Island Reds, we've used Bovin Browns, and Red Sex Links have been a very good bird. Thank you. Yeah. Right, questions? Yes, sir. Hold on. How the market do you have? I mean, how, 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 how many can you sell? How far can you reach? How many small mid middle farms do you need? Well, we have, right now we have seven partner farms and us, so there are eight farms all together. So we have 20,000 birds all together, not in the same location at different places. And so that's like 11,000 cartons a week that go out into the world. Um, you know, we're making an impact in our region for sure. But, you know, we're not making a national impact at this time. And I don't have aspirations to rule or have like a chicken egg pie. Um, you know, this is working for us. I would really love other people to adopt this model because it works. Question right back here. Thank you. Uh, it, it sounds as if there's a strong correlation between the chickens have, having natural lives and little farming. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us who are concerned about uh, consuming the products of factory farms uh, turn to labeling. And one that, that I have bought a lot is certified humane raised and handled which has been generally recognized, for example, by the Pew Foundation as being the most reliable and the best uh, humane certification. Do you guys participate in that at all, or is it? 
We haven't yet because they charge quite a bit of money to come out and look at your farm. And I, it is something we certainly do agree with. We definitely meet their standards. I went on their website and I checked it all out. And it's something I think we would like to do in the future. But we, we just, honestly, we've, we haven't gotten around to it either. We've been in business for about five years. We're starting to become more mature, and that's one of the things we should definitely do. We're not quite as scary hand-to-mouth as we were, and you make a good point. There's a lot of good certification programs out there. There are some not-so-good ones, too, but that is a good one. Any other questions? Well, first of all, that's a great program. Oh, we, good. And, and I think a lot of us learned a great deal. And I admire what you all have done, well, what your family you. has done. So for everyone who is now going to get backyard chickens, <laughs> this is locally laid. And I hope you will come visit with Lucy and let her sign the book for you. It would be a great holiday gift for our friends. <laughs> Please thank Lucy for being with oh, us. Thank you. Oh, music. And you know, it's holiday season. You're all going to go out to cocktail parties. I want you to know the reason that jumbo eggs are so fragile is because a chicken uses the same amount of shell, whether it's for a small egg or a big egg. It's like blowing up a balloon. Go out and really impress people, okay?